Welcome to Bermuda College Library. To both our virtual audience on YouTube and Facebook Live, as well as our small audience in, a, in attendance. For the launch of our Bermuda Traditions program, we, we've invited renowned chef Mr. Fred Ming to demonstrate some of his Bermuda Traditions recipes found in his cookbook of the same name. His son, Sean, is also a culinary lecturer here at Bermuda College and will be assisting him. Mr. Fred Ming worked as a culinary lecture, lecturer and also deputy head of Bermuda College in the hospital, hospitality department. He was first born Bermudian to be employed by the department. Chef Ming got his educational experience in London, England with the help of Neil Hansford Smith, who was in charge of the hotel school in Prospect. He made the arrangements for Mr. Ming to attend Ealing Technical College to do the culinary program 152, which is the highest one you could obtain in the culinary field. He also arranged for Chef Ming to do his practical at the world famous Savoy Hotel in London. He was the first black chef to be employed there. After completing his technical practical and th theory courses, he came back to teach at Prospect. When Bermuda College commenced in 1974, the college made plans for a combined college and the Stonington campus was selected. Chef Ming is considered one of Bermuda's renowned chefs. During his time at the college, he had the honor to meet the Queen of England, Princess Margaret, and several other dignitaries. Chef Ming also trained five college students to participate in several culinary competitions. But the highest was when the students each received a gold medal in the Taste of the Caribbean contest. In 2002, Mr. Ming was awarded the Member of the Order of the British Empire, MBE. With all of these achievements he, he's accomplished, he wishes to thank his wife, Dr. Charlotte Ming, who has assisted him along the, along the way. Chef Ming is a member of the following inst institutions. He's a fellow of the Cookery and Food Association of London, the Institute of Supervisory Management of London, the American Culinary Federation, and a past president of St. George's Rotary. I have the distinct pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Fred Ming, chef extraordinaire. Thank you very much. Well, after all of that, folks, I just have to put the icing on the cake. But this is the mean night, father and son. But as he said, I'd worked there several years, but now I also uh, have my son that's followed in my footsteps. Um, you probably perused through your menu already. Um, what we're going to do, take this step by step. We're going to sort of like um, um, have soup. I'm going to talk about it, and then we're going to have some students that will come around and give you a cup full, okay? And then after that, I'll be demonstrating on the chicken how to cut it up and talk about that. And then they would also give you a chicken and some rice on a plate for you to taste. Then my son, Sean, would tackle the uh, noodles. And then after that, they would give you a taste of that. And then, of course, to put the icing on the cake, you just talk about um, the actual, <clears throat> pardon me, the sauce. Now, we, when it comes down to soup, basically, anything can make up a soup, right? Most of you, when you cook vegetables, you may throw that liquid down the sink. But that could be considered as a vegetable stock. And when you, you can save that 
basically if, if you live by yourself or whatever the case may be or just one or two you can put it in the small containers but one convenient thing i find is that if you take your ice tray and pull your liquid into your ice tray and once that sets you can also crack it and put it into a bag and stew it so you only can take out one or two containers rather than freezing something all solid like that and you only need a couple of spoonfuls you got to throw out the whole entire uh, contents and of course making stock is easy also uh, like this particular soup has chicken in it so you get the chicken the liquid from that it will become what you call chicken stock but today you know the whole world has changed a lot uh, what i mean is that you can get little cubes of chicken you can get fish cubes you can get beef cubes and you find these out like not here to advertise but price right and of course in the marketplace they have certain things too but one of the problems is just that don't think that the more you put in you get a lot of flavor they can get a bit of salt too so you have to be very careful in terms of like not putting salt and and adding that to it also itself um but like I said, that a soup can be made out of for anything. If you got stuff left over in your fridge, make it up, and that's your your way of doing things. You find that one of the factors, like uh, when we made soups Christmas time, was always the barley soup. But then again, you don't put the whole package in there because you end up like a pilaf, you know, less liquid but a solid. That turkey um, rack, obviously. Uh, you can boil that down and make a nice, beautiful stock from that. And you could go on and on. Um, also, um, again, the liquid, if you got too much liquid, you can um, store that too. But tonight we have uh, corn and chicken uh, soup. And of course, uh, corn uh, niblets and corn, cream corn. Uh, what we've done is sweated on some onions and celery and then of course add some stock to that and then the other liquids uh, like uh, the stock and so forth and of course uh, what we're going to do now is to get the students down there to uh, put up some soup for you uh, to taste and then after they you taste the soups then of course we're going to go on and uh, I would be cutting up a chicken so that um, you uh, can have an eye there. So if you're really like uh, having a nice dinner, uh, well, you don't have to be that fancy, I mean, but uh, having a nice bowl, something like that there to, for your guests. And of course, um, everybody can take the time and uh, um, eat it. Of course, when my wife and I used to entertain, and I would say this is one thing, though, if you're entertaining, you find yourself stuck in the kitchen rather than being out there having a glass of wine with your guests. But I was kind of fortunate to say because I used to hire students to come in, show them what I want to do, and then it'd be, it'd be out there with my staff. Because to hire some people to come in just for a few minutes or so, um, it can be expensive to some extent, but it's 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 really nice though if you can um, arrange things or maybe put them uh, put it like a buffet, a simple buffet or something like that, so everybody can pick whatever they want. You know, this is the one way of them um, doing things. Um, so um, we let the soup come around, and um, um, we can get into like tasting that. Okay. And of course, all I can say that everything tonight is only going to have one adjective that is scrumptious. Okay, as soon as the uh, soups come around, um, Sean, can you get me some cups down here, please? Because I told us guys to get that soup going early. I've got some here I can put in a cup.
to this guy who I was talking to. Put your seat up. Okay. All right. What they doing now, Sean? Mm. You guys are filling those cups up, are you? Um, this one here. There you go.
Okay, folks. Uh, now we're going to tackle the uh, chicken. Um, what I'm going to do is cut the chicken up. Of course, you're used to buying uh, chicken already cut up. You can get chicken legs, drumsticks, and so forth. When I was teaching in the college and talking about poultry, I went to uh, Mr. Smith's farm and got a chicken from him. And I had it in a bag down the front of the, uh, my desk, and he was moving all about. So when the ladies came, and said, what's in that bag? I said, it's frogs. Uh, they dashed outside, you know, because the bag was moving about. But anyway, it was a chicken. What I wanted to do was to show the students how you treat a chicken from home. I'm more than sure some of you experienced that when you were coming up, how your parents used to kill chickens, you know, and how you used to pull these feathers off and so forth. But the water had to be a certain temperature uh, to get the feathers off. Um, but um, then they said, oh, you're cruel. I said, no. I said, are you, um, are you cruel when you go in the shop and buy drumsticks and so forth? You know, um, but um, um, that's how we used to do things in the old days. So uh, this is a whole chicken. And these are sold at the marketplace all the time in the butcher's department, whole chickens. And they're only like $9, you know, rather than like they have these other prices there for chickens. So I'm going to cut like the wings off. As a matter of fact, uh, during the competition going to the Caribbean and uh, Puerto Rico place called the La Conquistador, we, um, um, I, I decide to uh, do something different with chicken wings and we call them the little lollipops. And of course, uh, this is what um, um, what uh, I showed the students. And you know, when you get uh, like a uh, those little uh, cupcake containers, you get the small ones. So we rest all the uh, rings in there so they, they were uniform. So I pushed, we told the students to push all the meat down like that. And then of course we, uh, took this out like that, okay, and I cut them um, one bone out. And this is what we had, what we call like the little lady pop. And this was one of the things that um, um, uh, was won that competition, maybe won uh, like a goal uh, also. Now, cutting up the chicken, of course, uh, you would take the legs off first. Now, Christmas time, when I cook a turkey, I normally take my legs off. Well, the breast is the white meat, and that sometimes can get dry because the legs are what you call the dark meat. But what I do really is that take the leg off, I take this bone out, and that's where I put my stuffing. So when you, and then I just roll it up. So when you have your dark meat and your stuffing right inside that, and then of course you can just roast the breast to a certain temperature and not to get dry. Although you get some turkeys like Norbats and stuff has the little marker that pops up, but you can have your own uh, thermometer also. Um, okay, so I'm just going to, um, um, again, just take the legs off. So a chicken like this really uh, feeds like uh, four people. Uh, you get, for instance, like four pieces of the dark meat, which I'm going to divide that later on. And then, of course, this is like the breast, but I'm not, I'm just going to cut uh, down three on the side here. And of course, the breast is like where they make like uh, chicken a la Kiev and things of that nature. Uh, you can, um, you know, do something like that yourself, really. Uh, you can buy just uh, chicken breasts and um, um, do it up. But uh, there's a different way in, in sort of doing things. Now, this part I just cut through. And this is the carcass 
that's left over. And the old days when they had like, you don't see much of that civil service. They, this used to be cooked off or, or, or basically roasted and put on the bottom of the serving dish and everything or everything else used to be piled on top of it, you see. And but now this is part here you can make like your soup or your stocks and so forth. Um, any of you remember when you get Vaxanax? Eating Vaxanax? No? Oh, yeah, that's what your parents used to put into soups. The oldie Nax, you better suck them off, and the Vax, and that's how things used to go. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm going to uh, divide the, uh, just put some oil in there, divide the uh, legs, uh, the drumsticks from the, uh, the, the thighs. So, and then you can also like um, um, take your knuckle off if you want to, but you can catch your joint there and just divide that in half. And then of course, some people like to remove uh, like the fat. If you like on a particular diet, you can like move the fat, remove the fat also. And then of course you get, so you have four pieces of, of white meat and four pieces of the uh, dark meat. So we just need to uh, sip, put this through seasoned flour and then we just run it off. But uh, in this case, you should like start the dark meat almost first, okay? Because uh, that takes a little longer to cook. Now, when you put something in a frying pan, you always try to put it in like to let the fat go away from you. You don't drop it in and let it come towards you because you could probably end up burning yourself. Okay, so we're going to uh, give just a couple of minutes. Now, in the uh, dish, we have mushrooms and also some um, onions and uh, some sherry and tomatoes. Um, now, you can have like when mangoes are out, fresh mangoes, you can make up a nice sauce um, out of mangoes also, or just roast the chicken off, cut it up and put some slices of mango on it. Uh, but you don't have to wait for the season because you get, although when you get mangoes when they're nice and fresh, they're, they're at the best, but you can almost get mangoes all year round in a can. And it's just like, the, when you think about like papaya, papaya uh, how we used to like give one another off your tree. But now look at the price that you have to pay for uh, a papaya, you know? Um, but certainly, uh, it's the, they are delicious. They're really, really lovely. Um, I went to uh, the Azores the other day. I've been to the Azores before, my wife and I, but was just overnight on a cruise ship. But I was over there for like two weeks, and of course, there was plenty, plenty of Oh, and mangoes, huge things with a lot of flesh on them. And, Again, they were delicious, really delicious. But you know, uh, traveling, uh, that's one thing it was like my wife and I used to love going on ships, uh, traveling on ships a lot. And of course, before she passed away, we went around the world on a cruise ship. It was 115 days. Uh, which we thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy. But um, um, it was um, um, it was a great trip. Yeah, we thoroughly enjoyed it. But you know the funniest thing that folks who have money, they still know all the tricks. Uh, now the minks, when you go ashore, if you like gin 
or vodka, take a sure your empty water bottle and fill it up. <laughs> oh boy. I said, man, these folks, are, this is something else. But when I go to, on those cruise ships, I always get to meet the chefs and, of course, uh, food and beverage. And also, like the captain, give them a cookbook. So that's when my wife used to say, oh, you're something else. They're sending all this wine and champagne down to your room. And I said, well, it's for both of us. But um, um, now I go on cruise ships to demonstrate. Just demonstrating, basically. Um, I had several trips to put to go on, but because of the virus, um, things are not uh, going too sharp. Last Christmas, not two Christmas ago, before the virus came up, I was on a ship left Dubai. Uh, went down to Cape Town, 30 days. And I was able to do a demonstration with the chefs. And then a cruise director was a lady she said, Mr. Man, you got a lovely voice. I'd like for you to do the Christmas church service. Would you do that? I said, okay, I found some words to say. But then, of course, um, um, the latest was up and saying, Mr. Man, we thought you was a chef, but you're a preacher also. I said, <laughs> no. Well, it was a way of life when we all came up. We had to go to church and things like that. We couldn't argue with what our parents, uh, but uh, that was, you know, a thing that went down. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna just seal this a bit uh, light and get my uh, other ingredients going. And then I was let it all simmer into the gravy. Better little margarine and some chopped onion and of course uh, some uh, uh, rosemary. A lot of people when they come to Bermuda, they get excited to see a uh, rosemary grand wine. But the, the amazing, like all the old timers, is you use a lot of that stuff. And I know when I used to go down to my grandmother's a lot, how they used to make herb tea. That's how some of the old timers live a long life. That's what they survive on. And it was never an even number, they told me. It was always three, five, or seven odd numbers. As a matter of fact, going down to my granny's a lot, uh, that's why I started to write cookbooks because they used to write little things on a piece of paper and put in the drawer. You know, a lot of recipes uh, people had was like, or they say that a lot of ideas are going to the graveyard. Uh, but that's what how I, I decided. I said, let me come up with a, a cookbook and um, um, have something that is going to be in memory of people. And I used to go down there with my mom because my aunt Emma used to do a lot of uh, side catering. And uh, it's amazing. I guess some of you folks probably, some, I'm not too sure what you guys do, but some of the old timers still soak the raisins and rum at the beginning of the year. And uh, my brother and I, used to go down to Aunt Amos and then, because she used to make a lot of fruit cake and plain cake. And we used to have to cut up the raisins with a pair of scissors. Just still there chopping them like that. But now, you know, you can put them in your blender or just give them a little hint, just breaking them up a bit. And then it, then they soak them to put a little hot water so that they swell. And then of course the, uh, the black rum. And of course, when I was catering, Used to get all kinds of concepts. Oh, Mr. Ming, I don't want no rum in my cake. I don't want this here. I don't want that, you know. Uh, but uh, so that's to give the flavor. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, if you want to get your cake, you know, pretty good color, they used to put a little gravy, gravy browning into it to give it that little dark flavor. Um, but obviously, uh, a nice fruit cake is the essence. And 
uh, my uncle Reggie, he used to uh, make cake out for Amber Pots of Eight. And he used to have a lot of requests for the silver and gold cakes. And that is very expensive, those leaves. You just put a little water, take a little bowl and pat it on. And of course, um, um, that gives the appearance. But you do not put that cake in front of air condition because it would just blow all off. Oh, yeah, it would disappear. Yeah, because it's very, and that stuff is very expensive. Okay, I just put some sherry in there. Uh, that is very expensive, but um, um, that's what um, um, they used to uh, uh, do. And of course, you know, if you got your money, you can pay for something like that because it's like I said, it's time consuming but very expensive. It's what causes the uh, gold and the silver. Like in the Phoenix and X, Phoenix, they used to. Um, um, sell that stuff also um but uh you should buy so many sheets uh this is tomato concassi tomato chopped tomato is going to go in here okay and uh so this has been the fresh tomatoes that have been blanched to take your skin off once you you can blanch tomatoes in a bit of hot water then you put in cold water and uh just peel the skin right off uh, but, you know, that's something you don't have to really, really do. When I worked at Isawar in London, um, they used to cook, we used to cook, almost cook the order. Uh, but really, I, I was working on the sauce section, and that's the important section that's in a uh, hotel. And when you have like a thousand people, you have what you call a party system. doesn't mean that I'm involved in cooking everything. You have a party system, like all the entrees in one section, all the suits are made by another department, all the vegetables are made by another uh, department, and, and so forth. Um, but, um, and then we used to have a chef that used to be there nights. Uh, he was uh, actually uh, taking care of stock. He used to like babysit like skim all the fat off the stock and so forth. Uh, of course, what I do sometimes, I put set my stock into an ice container so that I get the fat to uh, congeal, and then you can take the fat off, okay? But uh, so this would have to uh, simmer down for a while, but uh, what I'm gonna do um, just, uh, let this cook for a couple of minutes, but I'm going to do a plate presentation. And then after that, we get the students to uh, put up there. Okay, you can start on the back there, please. Thank you. So we're going to serve rice with this uh, dish. And uh, some rice there like that. And uh, Add a little rose flower to put on the top. And since it's got rosemary in it, I just take a piece of rosemary and stick that in there like that. And uh, once upon a time, policy was put on everything. But now, it's, since it was so abused, it uh, doesn't go like that anymore. Okay, so that's how you can have a uh, nice um, um, chicken dish uh, with your rice 
and of course using the uh, um, herbs in it. And um, um, uh, so you should be getting a sample uh, of rice along with the uh, thing. Sean, just check to see what they're doing down there for me, please. I used to do a lot of uh, night classes here also. Um, people used to enjoy uh, coming to the night classes. As a matter of fact, even up today, when I bumped into some of the old students, they always say, Mr. Me, you can do something like that because we had a lot of fun. It was supposed to be when I did a dish one week, they do it the next week. But he said, no, no, you, you do all the cooking and just give us the recipes and let us taste the stuff. And well, it was a lot of folks that uh, actually, uh, like business people, you know, always entertaining or take, uh, going out for dinner or having a meal in-house. Um, but um, um, it was fun. Uh, I thoroughly um, um, enjoyed myself. Um, I pulled some tricks on them one night. It was Halloween night, and I was cutting up this chicken, but in the sink, I had put some uh, red coloring. And when I was cutting it up and I put my hand in the sink, I said, oh, I cut myself. They all dashed up. Can we take you to the hospital? Can we take you to the hospital? But when I got in the hallway, I said, look, I, I, that's not real. I, I was just... <laughs> yeah. But, um, um, yeah, the days going by when we used to cut up the rooster or the chickens and stuff and get chicken eggs. Uh, you don't get to see, like, the eggs now with a double yolk in them like you used to. You know, that used to be a big thing, basically, eggs with double double yolks. Um, but every household was always like have a chicken or so uh, for Sundays. Your Sunday roast, your chicken, because most people, I guess, miss the lamb now because of the price you got to pay for it. And um, of course, like the English always had the roast beef, but even that price is, is, is gone up. And of course, they had like Yorkshire pudding with it and roast potatoes and things of that nature. Um, when we lived in England, of course, uh, we, one of the things I liked about li in England was that if you wanted just two slices of ham, you can get buy two slices of ham from the uh, butcher and, and things of the day, a half a cucumber. But when we were setting up shop, it was like, you know, when you first get married, how you set up shop? Well, we didn't realize that we went to the market why you said, oh, get one of those potatoes. We want to put them later in your pocketbook. Well, we didn't know you had to take your own bags. In those days, yeah, you had to take your own bags to your mom uh, for shopping. Well, when it came down to Good Friday, I was at the Savoy this night, and I came home. He said, darling, I didn't understand it. I've been battling with this hot cross buns for a long time, and it doesn't seem to be rising, coming up. So you went over everything, detail, detail, check this out, check that out. And, of course, um, then I said, you sure you got the right flour? Yes. Well, you know, one thing in England, you can buy all kinds of flour. And where she made the mistake, she bought self-raisin flour. Now, self-raisin flour already has a raisin agent in it. And when you put more yeast to it, it, it combines, it just kills it. So that's why... The, the, the buns wasn't like coming up. And, uh, but it was a, you can get Yorkshire um, uh, mixture. Anyway, you know, put that to the side. And of course, uh, just clean away here a bit. And then, of course, uh, once you get your taste buds going, uh, we would um, um, get my son showing to start uh, this dish. But in cooking, is, we use a term called mise en place. Mise en place means the basic preparation prior to cooking. You get everything in front of you before you cook. Oh, I forgot something. I've got to reach up the cabinet, but my hands are dirty. That's how the knobs on your doors get all dirt on it because you got to reach up there to get something. 
but everything is organized. That's how you start the cooking, at this and at that and and so forth. And um, um and then of course like the way to like um, um it goes down. Um, you can have like a spoon with a little water uh, to taste your product to see how it is and you know if it meets your approval. One thing um, you find a lot of people who does this when they eat. They reach for the salt and pepper shaker all the time before even tasting the food to see whether it's tasty enough with that salt. Adding more sodium is not, you know, all that all that among um, kosher. But that's what some people do. Or even like when they're having a cup of tea, four sugars into, you know, like they're making lemonade. <laughs> but the um, mom, oh yeah, those are the things that the um, mom you you know you look out for. But uh, I guess um, um, buffets are always a big thing uh, of people attend because it has such a variety of foods there that meets with, like, your approval. Now, if you get on the cruise ship, of course, you get some people ask some dopey questions. What time does the midnight buffet start? Obviously, it's midnight, isn't it? <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, you get all kinds of things that goes down. But, um, um I think um, um, the main thing is to enjoy yourself. Yeah, we went to uh, Easter Island, and uh, and of course that's where all those statues are. Uh, rather strange how they got there, though. Um, I've taken students down to Australia, and uh, oh, up to Canada to compete in competitions. And the thing is that. Um, when students are training, um, I used to try to get them to discipline themselves. Oh, Mr. Ming, I can't come tonight. I said, if you can't come for practice tonight, then you're not going at all, you know. Um, but you have to organize yourself, basically, um, and discipline yourself. And when you see the end results, how this looks, how that goes together, does this match? Um, it's like in the days gone by, and your parents plated your food. You find that the rice or the starch was on one side, the meat was on another side, and of course, um, you find that the um, uh, the vegetables on another side. There was no unification. Okay, it should have been like together, and it's central located, and that way you find that the um, Unification, the plate, it looks much better. When it's separated, it looks like a divorce on the plate. But uni, unity does um, um, take it to such an extent. Okay? Um, but anyway, um, so you got the rice pilaf and, and your chicken. Um, I provided, I did boneless chicken so that we didn't have any lot of bones going around or trying to pick up meat with your hands and so forth. Okay. All right. So once we get that sorted out, folks, and then um, my son Sean will take over uh, while you're eating that. Um, you can probably start to. Uh, um, you want to move? Up here, or some of my stuff out, or what? Are you okay there? Okay. Yeah.
Okay. Hello. There you go. Thanks a lot, Diego. <clears throat> okay, good evening, everybody. Like my dad said, um, mise en place. Mise en place is very important. Um, mise en place is a French term, and um, literally translated from French to English, it means put in place, put in place. So fortunately for myself, my dad um, brought up, brought all the ingredients that I need. I'm just removing the lid so I can move through this very quickly. This is a very quick dish, doesn't take very long, and it's quite an easy dish. Um, this is what is referred to, I tell my students all the time, that this is what is referred to as physical mise en place, physical mise en place. Um, that's having all of your ingredients in place and your utensils and equipment that you're going to use. But I always try to emphasize to my students that there's a such thing as mental mise en place as well. What this means is that you, before you even turn on your fire, before you even start cooking, you want to read through your method. Okay, a recipe is, all, is divided into two categories, your list of ingredients and your method. So um, the amount of mise en place means that you know what you're doing from start right up to finish, right up into putting the food on the plate. And that's very important. And students come to me all the time and ask me a lot of questions, and I can tell that they haven't read the method from beginning to end. Sometimes they ask me, are my onions cut correctly? Are my peppers diced correctly? And um, they would have all the mise en place in front of them. And um, it looks really nice. The parents would be so proud of them. Everything is so neatly diced and everything. But somewhere down in step number six, it says place all the ingredients in the pot into a blender. Blender doesn't care <laughs> how neatly you with me. That's what I mean by having a mental mise en place. Yeah, I mean, we need to make things sure that things are diced evenly and so forth because um, it gives a uniform presentation. And also things cook evenly. However, like I said, a blender doesn't really care. So that's why it's good to have a mental mise en place as well. Now, I am doing a pasta dish. Oh, uh, by the way, for the uh, people that's out in the virtual world, if you're just joining us, I am Sean Ming, culinary instructor at Bermuda College. Uh, this was advertised by um, my dad, Chef Fred Ming, and I am Sean Ming, his son. Just in case any of you just joined in and you're wondering what is Fred Ming doing to stay so young. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I just thought I'd let you put that out there for you. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm his son, and um, my dad taught here for 28 years. And I got to teach alongside with him for about three or four years, which was a really good experience. And as of late August this year, I started my 25th year. So I can see I'm catching them up. And I'm hoping to exceed him, actually. <laughs> OK, so I'll be uh, doing a pasta dish. And uh, it involves one pound of muscle meat, one lime juice only, two cloves of garlic finely chopped, one tablespoon of parsley chopped, Two tablespoons of white wine, one pint of fish velouté. White wine, I haven't seen that. Here we go. Fish velouté. Does anybody know what a velouté is? Okay. Well, being at Bermuda, Bermuda College and not knowing what something is is a good place to be. I always tell my students that. Don't be afraid to um, ask a question because you're paying for your education. A velouté, you guys, is simply a white stock thickened with a white roux. Now, a roux is um, one of the number one thickening agents in the kitchen, simply um, 
butter and flour, or it can be oil and flour as well. Um, white stock, uh, yeah, white fish stock, white chicken stock, white beef stock, and emphasize in white stock because you end up with a nice creamy consistency. That differs from a brown stock. Um, if you want something to be brown, what we normally do is um, if you want a brown chicken stock, uh, you'll be roasting those burns and browning your mirepoix or your vegetables. Uh, if you wanted a brown beef stock, you'll be roasting the burns once again and browning your vegetables. So the ingredients for a white and a brown stock are exactly the same. However, there's something done differently to them. Um, there's something called, you guys ever heard of gravy browning? Yeah, that's for housewives. Yeah, chefs, chefs, we don't use we don't use gravy browning. If we, yeah, it is. Yeah, if we want something to be brown, uh, we brown our ingredients. We brown our ingredients. That's what we do. Okay, here we go. Now it starts off by saying cook noodles in boiling salted water for ten to twelve minutes until al dente. Does anybody know what al dente means? What does it mean? Not too soft, very firm. Yeah, I like that, Lisa. Yeah. Um, and you guys have a problem with your teeth, you go to the dentist, right? Al dente is an Italian term that literally translated from Italian to English means to tooth or with a bit of bite to it. Yeah. So, um, it shouldn't be soft and mushy. It shouldn't be soft and mushy. And um, when I got married, my wife and I, um, we actually went to Italy for our honeymoon. And um, these people were taking al dente, I think, a bit too far. Yeah. <laughs> Seemed like the um, pasta was almost like just been blanched. It was like undercooked. Yeah. It was undercooked. Um, if the pasta, when you're eating the pasta and it's sticking in your back teeth, what we know of as our wisdom too, Teeth, yeah, it's, it's undercooked, yeah. I was like, yeah, these people are taking this al dente stuff a bit too far. And I notice um, when I eat out and I eat over other people's houses and things of that nature that, um, to be honest with you, I, I think I've come to the conclusion that Bermudians really aren't into al dente. Yeah, they just cook the pasta until it's ready cooked. Yeah, ready to eat, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so... Fortunately, you guys, um, because pasta can take about uh, three to ten minutes, um, depending on the type of pasta that you have, um, I did show it up with the um, pasta already cooked. So under the method it says, cook noodles and boil in salty water for 10 to 12 minutes until al dente. Um, you guys ever heard of people putting oil in, in, your, in your water when you're cooking your pasta? You guys heard of that before? No, you guys are sharp, man. Yeah, um, that does work. It does work. Um, it, what, why do they do it? Anybody know why they do it? You got it. It prevents the pasta from sticking to each other and to and fr from sticking to the equipment. Yes, and you and normally um, when you're cooking pasta, pasta is very si something very simple to cook because um lots of water. I always tell my students ten parts water, one part pasta. Actually, on the course that I'm teaching right now, uh, my student back there can verify. I just finished two weeks of vegetable and starch cookery, and um, this week my students were actually making fresh fresh pasta. Every student had to make a batch of fresh pasta. And um, they, I, I can honestly say when I uh, first, my first introduction to fresh pasta when I was at the Culinary Institute of America, I was instantly converted. You know, I was instantly converted. And my students were quite surprised because um, you guys are probably used to going to the marketplace lenders and buying that dry stuff. But yeah, if you actually make it fresh yourself, you know, you guys, trust me, check it out. Um, So let me start. You guys are here to see a cooking demonstration, right? Okay. I noticed that um, the word saute is used twice. It says saute for three minutes without color in a saute pan. Technically, you guys, this is a saute pan. The French call it a sauteuse. Yeah, I tell my students, um, no longer use frying pan. Can't use frying pan anymore. You have to sound real professional. So the French call this a sauteuse. A sauteuse is, a, is, is technically a saute pan, and it has rounded sides. It's used for sauteing. A pan of this nature is called a sautoir. A sautoir has straight sides. 
Notice he's playing on some very similar. One is rounded sides, one is straight sides. And um, when I was doing French, and these, these pans are used for pan frying, um, when you're using a good volume of oil, and the, the straight sides make it a little safer. Straight sides make it a little safer. I remember when I was doing French at Barclay, um, I noticed everything, all of the um, norms, everything was divided into male and female. I found that really strange. And um, believe it or not, a sawtooth, which has rounded sides, is female. And a sawtooth, which has straight sides, is male. I'll let you guys figure that out when you're very home. Yeah. Yeah, because of the curves. You got it. <laughs> yeah. So here we go. So like I said, my dad showed up with all my mise en place. And the reason why I like a sautoir, I mean a sautouche, you guys, for sautine. Um, you remember I said, I said I thought the French were a little strange, dividing everything up into male and female. But um, to some degree, we even do that here in Bermuda without really knowing that we're doing it. Like um, if Mr. Lyndon Jackson showed up with a nice bike that had a nice really spray jaw and chrome parts, you'll say, Lyndon, she's looking nice, man. She's looking nice. You with me? You wouldn't say his looking nice. You with me? So we, we kind of do that in here in Bermuda, but without really knowing that we're doing it. Yeah. Okay, first step, it says butter into the sautoir, but really it should be a sautouce. One thing I, I would honestly say, I would probably prefer to uh, use a sautouce because I am sautéing. So I added my butter um, to the um, pan. Now I'm going to add my, my dad has the, um, onion and garlic mixed together. Do you guys know what the word saute means? Anybody know what saute means? Lightly fried. No, believe it or not, you guys, the word saute means to jump. It means jump. And that's the reason why you use a pan with carb size. If you guys ever see chefs doing stuff like that, it's not because they're showing off, it's because, because they're sauteing. Sauteing means to jump. So you guys, you guys are learning stuff today, man. Let's do it. I feel good about that. Okay, heat butter and saute air garlic and chopped onion saute for three minutes without color. So I'm going to make, usually a lot of uh, recipes would say um, saute onion and garlic until translucent. You guys ever heard that term before? You guys know what translucent means? Um, I wouldn't use the word clear. Um, yeah, the um, English dictionary, Webster Dictionary says, uh, not quite transparent, but emitting light. Yeah, so you see this container, you guys see how you can see my hand through this container? This container is translucent, but it isn't transparent. Yeah, it emits light, you can see stuff through it. Okay. It says saute for three minutes without color. Uh, my onions and garlic are starting to get a little bit of color. So it says add wine and lime juice to saute pan. But like I tell you guys already, this is really a sautoir. So when you guys go home um, from now on, um, when you have your rounded frying pans, start talking about a sautouce. And when you have your straight-sided pan frying pans, start referring to it as a sautoir. And the people that you're living with will be like, a saw what? Yeah, sautouce, sautoir. So you guys, I did say I'm making a pasta dish. And uh, what group of people in this world come to mind when you hear about pasta? Yes, everyone says the Italians. You guys will be absolutely correct. Yeah, the Italians come to mind. Believe it or not, you guys, um, thousands of years before the Italians, there's a rumor. It's believed that a, a gentleman by the name of Marco Polo. You guys ever heard of Marco Polo? Um, there's a children's game. I can't really, don't really know Marco Polo. Yeah, swimming. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, it's believed that a gentleman by the name of Marco Polo. Um, was responsible for taking pasta dough to Italy. However, um, 
most people say that this is a myth um, because thousands of years before Marco Polo was even around, uh, there are, there's evidence that pasta was found in China, in India, and so forth. And the reason why the Italians come to mind when you hear about pasta is because the Chinese, they just stuck with um, large flat sheets and noodles. Um, that stuff that you guys know about um, egg roll wrappers and spring roll wrappers, that stuff technically is pasta. Yeah, large flat sheets and noodles. This is the fish velute, right? Now, one thing about this pasta dish, you guys, I'm just making a very flavorful sauce, and then I'm going to toss the pasta in it, and the dish is done. But while I'm doing that, as you guys can see, you're learning stuff. I'm talking to you. Um, yeah, but Marco Polo, if, if it is believed that Marco Polo did um, take the um, pasta dough to the Italians, and the reason why the Italians have the claim of being renowned for pasta uh, is because when they got their hands on this dough, they went completely crazy with it. Yeah, you have um, all the different types of shapes and sizes of pasta. That's the, um, the Italians are responsible for that. Now, you guys have heard of an appetizer, right? Appetizer is just a little something that you get before your entree. Um, it stimulates your mouth for the um, main course. And um, does anybody know what an, an, an Italian appetizer is called? The word for appetizer in Italy? You got it. Antipasto. You guys are sharp, man. Antipasto. Now, so it says let this simmer for 10 minutes. So I got to talk to you guys a bit more. And um, antipasto. Now, antipasto is the um, common Italian uh, appetizer. And normally it consists of pickled, grilled, and roasted vegetables. It normally comes to the table family style. In other words, they'll bring a platter to the table and everybody gets a share. It also comes with various, amount, various styles of cheeses, various styles of olives, and uh, salted and cured and smoked meats. That's where you'll find your mortadella, prosciutto, uh, salami, pepperoni, and things of that nature. But another reason why the Italians have the claim or they come to mind when you heard the word pasta is because, as the latest did remind us that the Italian name for app appetizer is antipasto, literally translated from it Italian to English, it means before the pasta. So that means when you go to an Italian restaurant, there will be a pasta course coming. Keep in mind how, what I said, will be, not sometimes, maybe, only on Tuesdays, yeah, there will be a pasta course coming. So pasta is really big to the Italians. And that's the reason why pasta comes to mind when, I mean, the Italians come to mind when you hear pasta. Okay, I can move on. This stuff doesn't really need to reduce for 10 minutes as pointed out. So I'm just gonna add my parsley. And you guys might notice that the uh, mussels are being added towards the very end. And the reason why is the mussels are cooked. Right, the mussels are cooked. And um, I have a fond history of diving. My parents' house um, where my dad lives is Milot's Bay Lane. Milot's Bay Lane, I don't know if you guys know, know where that is. That's in Hamilton, Paris. And we go right down to the back. Um, I spent a lot of my childhood down there swimming. And um, we would dive up a lot of mussels. Basically, I'm on the board of Harrington Sun in Hamilton Parish. And um, actually, Milo's Bay, Milo's Bay, the actual bay, the beach is covered with mussel shells. I don't know if you guys have ever been down there, but one day, check it out. I'm sorry? Yeah, Mr. Fleming and um, a good friend of mine, Mr. Torbett. I think the uh, mussel fishermen in, in Bermuda are disappearing, or maybe can't even say disappeared. Yeah, I don't think anyone's really um, harvesting mussels from our waters. Which is a bit sad because um, that is one of those things that it is legal for us to remove from the waters. Um, you don't get a big fine if you remove mussels from the waters, unlike, unlike some uh, species that you'll find here in Bermuda. Okay, next, I'm going to um, correct the consistency with a bit of, actually, no, mussels come next. So like I said, you guys, adding these mussels towards the end. Right now, you guys, um, it's a shame that I can't put on a nice show for you because um, I don't have a sore tooth. Right now, 
I'll be tossing this stuff, but then you ever saw two of this stuff just goes up to the side and sort of stares there, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> So my mother and my mother um always tell her children that uh if you really want to my mother's one of Bermuda's um round in educators as my dad and um she told her children they have three children I have a uh, I'm in the middle I have a younger sister and an older brother and she told her children that um if you ever want a good job in in Bermuda become a teacher so all three of her children became teachers yeah we followed we followed directly in, in their footsteps. And my mother took that a little further. She said, uh, if you really want a good life in Bermuda, to marry a teacher. But none of us three did that. <laughs> but um, as you can see, my dad has always been talking about um, going on cruises and stuff like that. And yeah, they, my parents, they cruise all over the world. And, and because if you marry a teacher, then school's out at Christmas time, they're both off, and you could, and you vacation together. And when school's out in summertime, they're both off. And so, as young fellas, we got to take a lot of cruises all around the world and things of that nature. And um, especially my brother and I, when we became sixteen and eighteen of that age, my parents were summer during the summer on um, vacation. They would ask us what we like to go on a cruise with us, with them, and we'd be like, no. Yeah, you know, we were, we were fine to just. It was like vacation for us to be at home by ourselves and have them going. <laughs> Sorry about that there, but yeah, <laughs> that's how it was. <laughs> okay, next thing, you guys, I actually add a bit of heavy cream to this. Like I tell you guys, anybody can make this um, dish at home. And one thing, um, people have been making lots of money off of pasta for years. Pasta is quite economical. Um, most restaurants, they may have a little pasta section, and you might notice that um, it's much more economical or cheaper than the other items on the um, menu. But people have been making uh, lots, of lots of money out of just flour and water for years, which that's what pasta really is. Um, some most pastas are enriched with a bit of egg. It's not mandatory that it be, but most pastas are enriched with a bit of egg. And um, very enjoyable. One thing about pasta, um, it can really fill up your belly and give you that feeling of satiation, that feeling of being full, and um, quite enjoyable. It's right, very versatile too. Um, we have uh, mussels in this one, but you can put any type of meat, veal, chicken, Lobster, and obviously on uh, many styles of vegetarian pasta as well. No, this pasta is ready. So I'm just going to take this out. Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, my dad didn't bring any parmesan, but you are right. That's probably one of the number one cheeses that goes with pasta. Just a little pepper and spring onion garnish in the center with a bit of dill. And a few mussels within, still within the shell to give it a bit of pizzazz and class to it. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. So, do you guys have any questions for me? No, I think my dad has um, something. Did I... Was that a question? Any questions for me?
Yeah, that's a very good question. A little bit of this and a little bit of that. Um, to be honest with you, um, when I cook and I, and I, I used to marvel at my dad um, when I was a young fella, he was, especially when he's baking cakes and pastries and stuff like that, he's just throwing stuff <laughs> into the mixer. And to be honest with you, um, I, I, just, I just can't bring myself to, to follow a recipe. I just can't do it. Yeah. I'm, yeah. If you call, if you call me over to your house and say, here's the recipe, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> yeah. I, I just can't bring myself to follow a recipe. Um, I, and I think a lot of what it is, um, also is because, um, chefs keep some of the secrets to themselves. Yeah. I mean, you, you have to keep in mind that the goal of the chef is to make money and, um, we don't want people what i have to say um we keep our cards close to our chest um now you have the um food network program and the internet you can just about find out how to do anything and make anything right now however let's say i was doing a cooking demonstration and i revealed all of my secrets and you're like no i know what it is that makes that dish special if I give that secret out to you, you don't have to leave him and come to my restaurant, do you? You can just stay here and make it yourself. So um, I think that could be a, what a little bit of this and a little bit of that is all about. And sometimes they would say um, my special spice blend, things like that they use, and that's really keeping the cards close to the chest. I don't know if you wanted to say anything. Well, that, you know, that, because I in the know. old days, because they used to make it so often, they never measured out anything. It used to be a cup of this, a cup of that, or a pinch of this. I used to tell my granny, I said, well, your fingers are real big. You're talking about a pinch. But that's how they used to do things. And, and I used to look there, but it still turned out perfect just by having to stop there. Because they made it over and over, they just got conditioned to the actual sort of portions of whatever the case may be. Then, of course, now you you, you got to be careful. Like when you buy certain books, you've got the metric systems opposed to just the pounds and ounces and stuff like that there and then of course you also find that the uh the standard cups are not all the same either you get different cups that are like a normal cup is like about 12 ounces you get the others that can be a little larger and of course a cup and a mug is not the same it's totally different but you find that um even baking you know some people want to get things done in a hurry and they set the oven up too high, basically. But like um, my mom and my aunt Amber, when they were doing cakes, they always put like a pan of water on the bottom of the oven. So it creates steam and moisture so that the cakes um, um, itself don't um, get burnt. But uh, you remember the days, I'm not too sure during your time, but how do you take um, a piece of the broom, the sticks from the broom and stick it into the cakes? to see whether they were done or whatever the case may be. But, you know, hey, some of you may know about it, but that's just old stuff. But also, you can just use a thermometer and and, um, and test it in whatever the case may be. There were several methods, you know, that the old timers used to use. But one thing you would say that if you're talking to, like, a lot of the young people, they would say, well, you're old-fashioned. Well, all I can say, old-fashioned ways cause me to get where I'm today. And, and that's how things go on and on. But, um, um uh, bacon and cooking, obviously, uh, is very, very good. Uh, all of us have a different ideas about how we do something, but it's what is conducive to your palate, what you like best. It's just like if you have a fresh garden where you go down and pick your fresh vegetables every day, because nothing can beat um, goodness is from the garden to the table. So I hope all of you enjoyed yourself this evening. Uh, had you had them, um, a piece of sauce, just eat, eat that plate over there, Sean, for me. So this is a, a plated bit of sauce, and I have some sort of sweet and sour sauce underneath that. Now, you get all kinds of uh, ways of doing sauce. I know Christmas time, every, all the guys were fighting for the pig's head. Get the pig's head, and then, of course, got the cheeks in it, where you get a lot of the um, um, meat that's there. Uh, but you find people also make chicken sauce, okay, and then some vegetable sauce. Now, you got to be careful. If you're a vegetarian, you can't use gelatin. 
you, you use a substance called agar agar, but you can buy it in the house store and things of that it comes from like seaweed. But um, because they find that the gelatin comes from the hoofs of the animals. But what some of the old timers used to do is put the pig's feet in the pot when they the boil it. So that produced gelatinous uh, consistency. And um, um, different ways. I know that my mom used to make soaps. Again, she would put it in her ice tray so she got portions. And then just like when it's set, and then just take the stuff out. And um, you, you find that uh, people, uh, because of what they had or what type of equipment they had, they made use of it. And it was all the, like the spoon of this or another spoon of that or a tablespoon of this. But I used to get my mom, when I was doing the catering business, she used to make all my cake for me. Uh, Christmas time, do some of you remember when they used to put a small coin in the pudding? Like the old six penny piece? Yeah, and if you got that, you're supposed to have good luck. Um, but then again, how we used to cook the puddings outside of the house, like in a tea cloth or something like that there, you know. But there were very ways that people used to deal with things, going back to the old days, but now we're living in more of a modern society. Okay, folks, so I hope that you thought you enjoyed yourself this evening, and I hope you can be able to sort of take those tips and maybe substitute if you don't want mussels, you can use something else as your basic product, just the mushrooms or whatever the case may be. Um, but, you know, hey, uh, just take it a little further and increase your vocabulary um, and doing other dishes. So when you serve it to your guests, you say, oh, where you picked that up from? Oh, it's one of my ideas. Okay, folks, so glad you have to come. Um, if there's no more sort of questions, then okay. Hope you thought you enjoyed yourselves. I wanted to thank everyone for coming this evening, and I wanted to especially thank the uh, people who served and uh, the two culinary students, Gideon Wedden and Kush Bell. Um, Nicole DuPont, who's our instructional technician here at the library. Tanya Rattery, who helped serve, and especially to Shelley Riley, my administrative assistant who organized this event. So thank you very much. And on behalf of Bermuda College, I want to thank you, Mr. Ming. It was a very informative and enjoyable evening. So this is just a little token of our appreciation. And Sean, thank you very much. No problem, Robert. <laughs> it was a pleasure cooking for you guys as well. Um, you guys were a very good audience. I appreciate that. Yeah. And um, all of the dishes that were prepared today, you can find in my day at cookbooks. Yeah. So feel free to patronize them. Yeah. And also, I just want to thank the people from IT, Diago. Um, Thank you very much for coming out this evening. $25, if anyone is interested. Um, I, the three recipes actually are in this Bermuda Traditions book. <laughs>